So um, thanks very much, uh, Will. Um, this is joint work with Martin Fleischmann, who's on the call. So as usual, all the hard questions later can be routed directly to him. And as Will said, this is part of a broader project that is called the Urban Grammar. Um, although the grammar aspect will come in later in the project, this is, um, you can think of it more as the, as the words that then you put together th with grammar rules. Uh, we're calling this the spatial signatures and it, it's looking at um, form and function in cities in, in Great Britain. So a couple of slides on why we think uh, working on this area is, is useful and it's interesting. And the basic point is, is this statement basically that how we arrange stuff in cities, whether the stuff is built environment or is activities that take place within cities, matters and that whether you have a city like on the left map, which is uh, Washington DC, heavily planned um, following a, a very specific type of design or something more like the city on the right, which is uh, Phoenix, Arizona, archetype of the um, post-World War II development, urban sprawl, everything that urban planners don't like. So whether you have one city or another, different outcomes might be different. Um, and there's a growing and mounting body of literature anywhere from urban economics to environmental sciences that is documenting how very clearly there are systematic patterns that are aligned with different types of, of cities. And this goes anywhere from uh, economic productivity to uh, development issues in, in uh, developing countries on or low and middle income countries, all the way to sustainability questions like emissions or um, dependency on on car technology, for example. There is all of this is a, a wide academic literature, but there's also a mountain and and recently there's there's more and more uh, or a series of uh, or a growing series of re policy reports from organizations across this scale, anywhere from local authorities all the way to places like the UN or the OECD that have been paying attention to these. And the last one, I didn't put it on the slide, but a couple of weeks ago, the World Bank presented another report that was specifically focusing on urban form um, and urban spatial structure. So these things, they are interesting academically speaking, uh, but they have a very clear direct uh, or very clear link to to how we build and how we invent and how we design the cities of the future. So broadly speaking, when I said how we arrange things uh, in cities matters, I was really implicitly referring to two things. One is form, which is probably the more traditional way of, of looking at these, which is asking the question, what does it look like? What does a, a city look like? What are the uh, building blocks that are tangible in a city uh, look like and how they are arranged. What is the physical structure and the appearance of cities? However, uh, if we stopped at this, then we, we, we would be considering cities essentially as containers of things, but we wouldn't be looking at how these things are arranged spatially. And for that, we also think that you need to go um, into the function territory and consider not only what a place or what a, a section of a city looks like, but what it is used for. So what are the activities that take place within that environment? What can you do and what is being done in, in different aspects? And and there's a lot of, we can pick it up on the questions later if you're interested in a bit more on why we think that looking at form and function is interesting and is useful. But broadly speaking, uh, the two are closely interrelated, so form provides the context for function, and over time, different functions start shaping uh, the way cities look like. So there is a, a bidirectional relationship there that that connects the two very, very deeply and intimately. So when you're looking at one, you're you're sometimes really looking at the other one without realizing. So we think it's it's interesting to to look at the two, um, and also it. As you will see later, if you, with the data example, if you consider both at the same time, you you, we think you're going to get much more robust, um, a much more robust picture of of how cities are structured and and laid out over space. So of course we're not the first one looking at form and looking at function or even looking at form and function together. There's a 
long tradition from many different disciplines. Uh, where we think there is a gap and where we think there is an opportunity is at the intersection of these, this Venn diagram. And we started joking, but it's actually, we realized that it's not a joke that out of these three uh, characteristics that you would want or we would want for um, academic analysis informing policy evidence or informing evidence and decision making, uh, that you would ideally want detailed analysis or detailed data that is scalable at the same time. So you can do it, you can do the same analysis across a large uh, portion of the geography and you can do this in a consistent way. Out of these three things, most of what we've been able to find in the literature, you can pick two. So if you, if you look at um, detailed uh, analysis and uh, consistent, it has to be most of the literature is case studies that look at very small regions at, at most cities or, or metropolitan areas. Um, if you look at consistent and scalable analysis, there's been quite a lot of action. And I think it's one of the most exciting areas in 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 this space in the last few you know, five years. Um, most of that is not very detailed because it's really hard to get data for large portions of the earth in a consistent way that allow you to, to do this analysis. So most of what you find in the consistent and scalable table is things that focus on either form or in very specific parts of, func of function like mapping population and high resolution. And there is a little bit, although it's, it's not uh, direct, um, but there is also you could consider detailed and scalable in that there is a ton of case studies that look at form and, and function in, in different ways, all looking at their own parts of the world, that the one city or one region, when you put them together, they kind of scale in the sense that they do cover a large part of the world, but they're not consistent. They use very different data sets. In many cases, they use very different ways of measuring form and function and comparisons are to be done if so if, if you are going to do them that you have to be uh, extremely careful it's also not readily available because it's it's very piecemeal right so the the effort of collecting all of that data is is non negligible so in this space what we're trying to to hit is the jackpot in the middle where we get a detailed analysis that is scalable across a large region. And in our case, we'll be presenting Great Britain, but there isn't anything per se that, that is pretty in the approach. So there's plenty of space to take it somewhere else. And from the very beginning, consistency is baked in because what we want to do is generate uh, an understanding that is comparable across all of these, uh, uh, all of these places. And for doing this, we present this idea that we call the, the spatial signatures. So Will was talking about the urban grammar, which is the, the bigger project. That's about understanding how cities change. And to understand how cities change at, at um, higher resolution, we need to have these building blocks that are combined in different ways over time and that are evolving in, in, in specific sequences. So if you think about the, the parallel with uh, grammar, we need to know what are the words, what's the vocabulary for expressing form and function, and that's what we call signatures. So in one sentence, the, the elevator pitch of what we're trying to do is that this is a characterization of space based on form and function and is designed to understand urban environments. So if you and pick this, it's a char characterization of space. So two things, we're basically developing a classification, building a typology, something that takes a lot of theories and a lot of conceptualization, but at the end of the day, should be relatively straightforward to understand and very, very um, amenable to being used in ideally in, in policymaking and, and for non-technical audiences. It's also, when we mean, what we mean by space is that we are trying to fully partition the geography. So unlike other types of analysis that take units of analysis that are not fully exhaustive, we are, uh, you can think of it as we're taking a massive cookie cutter and then putting it on top of Great Britain in this case to divide it up into places that are consistent in terms of form and function. The second one that is unique, we think of, of our approach is that we consider both form and function, both in detail, but together and, and combined. And the final one, which is probably the most important one in, in our context is that it is a classification. There's a lot of classifications 
for um, what you could broadly call form and function. If you're familiar with land use or land cover classifications, there's a, many of them. Uh, most of those are focused on, on understanding the earth. And because cities don't take up a lot of space in the big picture of things, they really don't have a lot of detail when you look at cities. And we're almost flipping this uh, upside down and focusing on cities, even though we're covering the entire geography. So you'll see a few, uh, you'll see a few examples later of what I mean by, by this focus on, on urban environments. So technically speaking, this is a, a very broad overview of how we, how we're building these spatial signatures. And then I'll give you a bit of detail later on how we did it for Great Britain in particular, what type of data we used, but the general process and the the uh, three phases of building spatial signatures um, unfold in these three three steps. The first one is what we call the enclosed tessellation, which is dividing, is building this cookie cutter that I was talking about a minute ago, that allows us to divide up Great Britain into units that we think are um, meaningful and and good for 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 measuring later form and function. Then once we have those those polygons, we attach a whole lot of information to those around form and function, and then we cluster those into areas that we call the signatures. So let's unpick this a little bit more. Uh, you're going to see on the top of the uh, slide the different stages, how we call them. So you can uh, see there as the process um, kind of advances because it takes a few steps. Um, we start with what we call the limiters. Um, so things that people perceive as barriers um, when they move around geography. Again, this is focused on how we, or is, is sourced in a lot of literature on how people move around cities, but we're expanding this to, to all of the geography. So we're using for these things like streets, like um, rivers, like railways, features of the build well of the build or of the natural or the natural environment that we think partition and divide up the geography and we call these delimiters we blend them all into one layer that we call a layer of enclosures and this gives us a first candidate of polygons and then on these we add what we call um anchors which are buildings and there's a lot of theory on, on urban morphology and, and urban studies on why buildings are taken as, as these um, milestones and anchors of, of how the built environment is read. So what we do is we overlay these enclosures, these polygons with, with buildings to subdivide these enclosures where, they're, where the enclosures are, are large. And we end up with these um, small units that take the area around a building but as it is limited by natural uh, delimiters, things like streets or railways or rivers or highways. And this gives us this cookie cutter, this big uh, set of small or in, in urban areas, very small polygons in uh, countryside areas. We'll see that they're a little bit bigger or, or much bigger, um, but that they are exhaustive of the geography and that they are built around many ideas on how cities are constructed and how cities are experienced and, and uh, read. And once we have this geography, as I was saying, then we attach a lot of information around form and function for each of these units. And uh, we'll see in a, in a minute what type of information we're, we're using to characterize. Well, this is what we call the characters of form and, and function. These, uh, in pragmatic terms or in, in technical terms, what is giving us is a very long table where every row is one of these polygons and then every column is one of these characters of form and function. And we cluster those into, uh, we use a clustering, traditional clustering algorithm to come up with the typologies, the key, what we will call the key signatures. And because many of the small, what we call the enclosed tessellation cells, these small polygons will be uh, continuous and, and within the same class, then we dissolve this. And ultimately that is what we will call a signature. So every polygon with continuous uh, units of the same class. And whoops. And in 
this is a, a big picture of what we're trying to do. We start, remember, with um, delimiters, things that divide up space. We blend it all into one layer of enclosures. Then we overlay that with buildings and use that to subdivide, uh, in some cases, um, the geography into more fine-grained units that we call we call the enclosed tessellation cells. We attach a lot of information or characters about, we characterize based on form and function each of those polygons. We cluster them and aggregate them into areas that are consistent in their characteristics of form and function. Now, that's the general approach for spatial signatures, and you can do that on, on any region. And in fact, Marty and I have a paper that should be coming out hopefully soon, um, where we demonstrate that with a few cities are across the world, just to give a flavor of how it can be done. What I'm presenting here is how you can scale it up to a serious level, to a national level. And we're, we're presenting here an, um, a spatial signature classification for all of Great Britain. So what are the characters that we use? For form, we use things like dimension, shape, intensity, connectivity, diversity. All of these are characteristics of the building, the set of buildings and the set of uh, streets and combinations of the two. Sometimes we use um, both the street network and the building footprints for creating some of these form characteristics. And then for function, we use things like population, uh, density, employment density, industry of, of the employment, land use, land cover of some of those more traditional classifications, and then access to a whole bunch of, of amenities. And when you put together all of the unique characters that we use for each of these um, small units, you end up with about 300 columns of ways of describing um, the form and function of a specific area. We end up with 300 because for many of the form and function characteristics that we use, we calculate scores for the unit itself, but we also recognize that many characteristics are as determined by the context as much as by the, the unit itself. So for almost every characteristic, what we do is create a measure at the unit level, and then we create um, this descriptives of what that measure or what that character looks like in the immediate context and it's it's geographic was weighted over over space so the immediately adjacent ones weight have a, a bigger weight than the ones that are a bit a bit further and this is how we get to 300 characteristics that we use for for clustering the data sources that we use for form is almost entirely Ordnance Survey open map and open roads. And we know that this is not the most uh, detailed data set that is available, but is the most detailed and consistent open data set that is available. And we're very serious about being able to make these classifications useful. And part of that is A, being open, but also being able to release the results. And if we use more detailed data sets, we wouldn't be able to to release derivative products. And, and that's that's a deal breaker. So we stick with um, open map and open roads from Ordnance Survey, which are still fairly detailed and completely comparable and scalable. And then for function, we use a very long list of, of data sources, anything from the population census to business censuses, uh, open street map for uh, some of the amenities, geolytics for other amenities, um, the uh, data sets on listed buildings for England, Wales, and, and Scotland, some information from the CDRC around uh, retail mostly, and then the classifications that we use come from the European Space Agency, the Korean classification, and we derive some directly from uh, Sentinel-2 from optical satellite imagery, um, as well as the night lights. So it's pretty comprehensive set of data sources that feed into a, a fairly comprehensive list of form and function characters that then we're, we are able to, to combine all together in this one typology, right? So I've gone through this, I think, in five minutes in, the, in Great Britain. It took Martin about uh, five or six months just to collect the data and then another five or six months to get it into 
into a shape that was amenable for analysis, but conceptually that it's it's not that that complicated. The devil is always on the technical details. So once you do all of that work, once you bring together all of that data and um, align it with each other and are able to cluster it, what you end up with is, is this uh, detailed but scalable and comparable classification of form and function for all of Great Britain. This is what we call the, the British signatures. And before I, I carry on, just a quick heads up that the classification were pretty confident that this is what we want and this is robust and, and solid. How we are um, selling the classification, we have a few things that we think are really interesting, but if you think there are other aspects that you would have liked to see or things that you, um, you're you missing from our, our results, uh, we would very, very much welcome any type of comment on, on these because we're still, this is very much still work in progress. We, we've spent most of the, the past year getting data and then getting this classification to make sure that it makes sense statistically and, and, um, and substantively, but we're still figuring out how to best package it up and, and sell it. So I didn't give a lot of numbers, but just to give you a sense, these um, small units that we use to build up the, the, the full classification amounts to 14 million units. So there's a lot that you don't see on this map. Um, and it's really hard to, to give an overview, a general overview of something that that is super detailed, but at the same time covers the entire um, the entire country. So the way that we've decided to go through is in two routes. First, I give you a general overview of the type of classes that we identify, and then give you a few um, stylized facts that we think are really interesting that come out of the classification and that in some cases we didn't necessarily expect when we went into it. And we think that's where most of the value of doing this kind of analysis lays. So. In terms of the general classes that we find, um, broadly speaking, we do something like 20 classes. Martin will probably drop in the chat the specific number because I've said it wrong, but it's about 20 and there's a couple that are outliers that we remove. And then we end up with uh, about 16 classes that, we can, that you can, once you look at them, you can see how three of them are very clearly what we would call the countryside. Mostly on the map, you can see the uh, green and yellow. Um, green, more natural land. Yellow, more um, agricultural type of land. And blue, um, closer to, to developing, to developed areas. And then what we call urban areas, which is a large, uh, a large group. Uh, of classes that we subdivide or we subname as periphery, suburbs, and cities. And then each of them, periphery, there's only one class, but within cities, we have a, host, a whole host of classes. And going back to the um, point that I made before about how this compares to other use classifications or function classifications like land use or land cover classifications, we're having effectively three classes out of 19 for um, everything that is not a city, and then the rest is for areas that we would call urban. So we're almost flipping this proportion of, of traditional classifications. So um, just to give you a quick uh, or uh, hopefully a, a better flavor of what this looks like, in, if you zoom into an area, here is the, um, the Scottish urban belt that goes from Glasgow to to Edinburgh, and you can see how uh, very clearly it picks up very well different things. It picks up parts that are um, rural, automatically kind of uh, uh, identifies those. And then if you focus only on, on cities, it also gives you quite a bit of detail anywhere from more peripheral areas. And we'll zoom into a couple other cities now, so you can see a bit more of what, what it picks up. But to come back to, to the general picture, you can see how it's consistent and it, it's because at the end of the day, we're summarizing 14 million rows into uh, about 19 groups. A lot of them, and also because of the way that we've developed this classification, you end up with areas that are um, larger areas 
but that are consistent and you can see the, the gradient that appears in Glasgow and in, and in Edinburgh. Now, when you start looking into what's going on inside cities across all of Great Britain, one of the things that kind of jumped out our eyes uh, most notably is this idea of what we call this hierarchy of urbanity in that there are some classes that when you look at um, how they're built up, they have form and function characteristics of, of characters that only appear at certain levels of what you would call the urban hierarchy. So, and at the most extreme, there's a couple of areas that only London um, has. So if we zoom here into, this is the, the center of London, you have a, a super core center around Soho and, and Covent Garden that we, that's here in, in green. And then that is surrounded by another uh, small, pretty small ring that uh, goes over to the city of London that's in black. These two classes only appear in London across the entire um, the entire 14 million units. You, we only identify these characters uh, in the city, in the center of, of London. Now then, this is wrapped up by this darker uh, red and then these more, I'm going to call it, I don't know how to call it. I'm not. I'm not going to give it a a, a name, um, but more uh, another shade of red. And then, once you step out far enough of the urban core, you start seeing these dark blue and and yellow. Now, when you look at an area like Leeds, for example, you don't see the green. You don't see the black. What the city center, the core of the city is, starts, so to speak, at this dark red, and then that is wrapped up by the uh, other type of red, and that is then wrapped up by blue and by yellow. And Leeds is an example of what we call this tier two of urbanity that also encompasses places like Birmingham or Manchester, or Bristol, or Edinburgh. Uh, Edinburgh and Glasgow, if you remember the slide uh, um, before, also had these classes. And then there's a third tier that you can look at, for example, in Cardiff, where these two reds, if I remember correctly, also don't appear. Where you start, the urban core starts at this dark blue, and then that's wrapped up by, the, by yellow. And, and um, then as you move concentrically or almost in a, in a gradient that we, again, didn't impose, that is the nature of British cities or many British cities, um, it starts popping up in the in the surrounding areas. And if you keep going down, you can almost draw up a, a perfect hierarchy on, on these. If you uh, go to a place like Milton Keynes, fully or almost fully developed post-World War II, very planned, uh, heavily um, designed in, in some particular characteristics, then that doesn't even have the the dark the bright yellow or the dark blue. It starts with this other other class that in um, in Cardiff, for example, you would find here in the northern part of the city, or in Leeds, you would only find in in more not peripheral but more out of the city center areas, right? So this idea of hierarchy it it probably sounds obvious once you see it in these, but we it's something that we went into not necessarily um, expecting or not expecting at least this clearly. And just to um, give you a bit more more flavor of, of what this looks like compared to other characteristics or to other classifi existing classification to, to further make this point that I was this, talking about before, that this is not another classification of land use or, or land cover. This is an example of the Northwest with Liverpool and Manchester uh, with the spatial signatures on the left and uh, something that the European Space Agency bills called the Urban Atlas, which is supposed to be a land use classification for cities, but it's based on singular uses. So it's not a, a composite um, typology like our signatures is, is focused on single uses. And you can see how it's much more um, patchy and the type of patterns that it picks up is are, are, are rather different. There's no concentric gradient, for example, as we pick up in the city centers and is much more focused on, un well, on unique uses because that is what it's trying to, to do. And then um, many 
in the audience will probably be familiar with uh, geodemographic classifications, which is another long, uh, uh, well, another approach that has long tradition, particularly in, in the UK. And they are, in a way, a classification based on function, but they're mostly based on a single function, which is residence. So here you have, for example, Oak, the output area classification for London compared to the to the signatures for uh, for roughly the same area. Again, the type of patterns that, that you can see and the type of um, lessons that you can learn about space and about how the city is is uh, built up and unfolds over space are are quite different in 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 the two. And this is not to say that one is better than the other. Is to make a very clear point that they are very complementary. And that if you're focused on understanding residential population, then that that's great. That's why we have geodemographics. If you want to parse cities based on what they look like and and how they're used. To, uh, or how they're used by, by different actors than you have um, the signatures, which we think are, are a better um, application. So just wrapping up to get to my 30 minutes in time, um, three points to take away from, from this talk. The first one is that hopefully, uh, I've, if you weren't, I've convinced you that form and function are relevant because they, they tell us a lot about how cities are designed, but also how they're used and how they um, influence a whole range of outcomes that that we uh, as academics, but also as policymakers care things, anything from productivity to uh, sustainability. And in this context, we've, we've presented and framed the spatial signatures, which really at the end of the day, what they are is form and function for cities in detail and at scale, and all of those three things in, in one. And the broader point here is that we've built this classification because ultimately what we're thinking is we don't have good ways of building measurement at scale of, of these things. And, and it's hard to understand something that, that you cannot measure well. So now that we have a, a detailed classification that spans across a very large region of, um, of, of the earth, we can start hopefully unlocking a whole bunch of analysis that they would love to, to engage in the in the coming months. And with that, I, I think I am uh, within time and, and happy to take questions or comments of, of any kind. Thank you very much.